Last week, <laughs> Tim shared powerfully about the Word of God, what it is, uh, why it works in our life, and why it is really a delight when we come to it with humility, we come ready to be shaped by it. And so this whole series anchored, we're looking at the Word of God and how it is important to tether our lives back to or come under the authority of God's Word and what that means. And so if you weren't here last Sunday, please go to our YouTube channel, familycenter.tv and watch Tim's message because I really feel like it was a great way to frame the start of this series. And so Tim and Nikki are um, CFC South. He's our CFC South lead pastor. They're launching CFC South in just at the end of August, August the 26th. And so they're meeting again tonight. So keep them in your prayers. So not only do the scriptures show us Jesus, they show us Jesus, they also reveal to us our need for him. They reveal to us our need for him. And so you are not here by accident today. Maybe you have never read the Bible for yourself. You might respect it as an ancient text, but think it is irrelevant, boring and outdated for today's modern society. Maybe you've tried to read parts of it, but you found it really hard to understand, and so you're sort of not sure where to start. Well, maybe like Tim was talking to some of us or all of us here, we come to the scripture looking for really encouraging bits. We think, yep, I need a bit of a pick-me-up, take me to Psalm 139, love that. And then, you know, we find passages that really um, affirm what we believe, and then the challenging bits, the bits that we have to wrestle with, the bits that we don't quite understand at first glance, we sort of tend to leave them alone. <laughs> and all of us can be tempted to do that. But throughout this anchored series, we're being reminded that we are not the experts of our own lives. Sorry to break it to you this morning. <laughs> the Bible, the book that Christians around the world believed is God-breathed scripture, starts with the following four words. In the beginning, God. Your life starts with your creator. It doesn't start with you. So Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made you, just like I was praying over Kingsley. He wanted you to be born. <laughs> he loves you. He wants to speak to you and teach you how to live. Yes, for your own flourishing, but also for his pleasure and his delight, because you were made for that. And so he's given us a guiding compass, a manual for living, a wonderful handbook that reveals to us his son, Jesus. And so I remember the first time I ever prayed and really meant it. It was when I said, God, if you're real, show me. And soon after this, I found that I had this growing urge to dust off my Bible that my parents had given me that I'd shoved under my bed that probably had lots of other junk under it. <laughs> and I had this desire to want to read the Bible and come to it with an open mind, willing to see what God, if he wanted to reveal himself to me, would have to say. And as I read, something happened. It was like the words jumped off the page and some of them were so freakishly relevant to my life they could not have been possibly orchestrated by human hands. Like it was like speaking to my situation. So much so that I could begin to do what I can only describe as squirm. On the inside I was like, oh, this is, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at it. What the Bible says about what life should look like, and I'm looking at my own life, and I'm feeling like there's a bit of a mismatch. I knew there was this way, some ways that I was living and some choices I'd made that were not pleasing to God. And I realized I'd been looking for love in all the wrong places. I was numb on the inside. I was so passive and uh, really dead, I would say, on the inside. But I also kept reading because there were so many verses that talked about God's unconditional love and his, and his desire to want to know me and have relationship with me. And so for the second year in a row, a friend invited me along to an Easter presentation or Easter service here. 
And I came along, and I just don't remember everything that Pastor Bill shared that night, but I remember feeling an amazing sense of the presence of God that was so real. It was like God came up close and personal to me, and I knew that he was real, and I knew that I wanted to know him. I didn't know everything about what it means to follow him, but I just knew that I wanted him. And so I talked to God, because Pastor Bill told us to just pray to God in our hearts, so we didn't have to say it out loud per se at that point in time, but just pray in our hearts and talk to God between us and him. And I said, I want to know you, God. Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you're real, and I actually want to know you. even with the parts I'm unsure about. And so I invited him to come in and said, lead my life. And he's been leading it for 19 years. And I'm so grateful that I had that opportunity to hear about Jesus' love for me. But it started with a prayer, an open mind, a willingness to give the Bible a go. And so if you've written off the Bible and said, you know what, my parents are into it, that's really not me, you haven't met Jesus of the Bible yet (laughs) and you need to open it up and look again look for the first time even with an open mind come to it honestly come to it with an open heart come to it saying God would you show me who you are because it's not just a textbook it reveals to us our need for Jesus and so in Psalm 119 we find the author on an honest pilgrimage desiring to live a God honoring life Because he has seen God's sovereignty, goodness, and faithfulness firsthand, the psalmist longs to live a life that is pleasing to God. So we're going to pick it up from verse 57. He says, You are my portion, Lord. I've promised to obey your words. I've sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. Now, portion, why would he use that word? Well, portion actually in in that context means you're my inheritance. (laughs) You're my lot in life. You're my everything. You're my home and my reward. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So he says, you are my portion, Lord. I've promised to obey your words. I've sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. So throughout this psalm, he's determined to keep the law of the Lord. He promises to meditate on it. He promises to delight in the word and not forget it. He promises to run in the way of the Lord. But it's interesting what he doesn't say in this verse. He doesn't say, because I have sought your face and promised to obey you, your words, (laughs) be gracious to me. He doesn't say that. He says, be gracious to me according to your promise. According to your promise, that's mentioned, or according to your law, according to your uh, word, that is mentioned 17 times in Psalm 119. It's like he keeps coming back to God's mercy. He keeps coming back to God's faithful love. He keeps coming back. He said, I've promised, and I went astray, and my heart went astray, and I came back to your words, but... Be gracious to me according to your promise. It's a recurring theme when you read Psalm 119. What was the promise? Well, in Isaiah 55, we get a glimpse. It says, God's saying to his people, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Everlasting. David died physically. He's in God's presence now. But what was this everlasting covenant? Was to was it was to David, but what that's, that context is saying is actually to David's son, Jesus, who would come through the lion of David. Through him, you will experience God's faithful love. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. And he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. The promise was God's faithful love that was to come through the anointed one, the Messiah Jesus. An everlasting covenant that would never end. (laughs) And as people turn to him, they will receive God's mercy and find his pardon. 
And so the psalmist knows, like us, it's so much easier to make promises to God than actually to keep them. Am I right? So much easier to sing songs and go, yes, God, I love you. I'll follow you to the ends of the earth than to actually do it. Don't you reckon? Is that just me? When we come to God's word, we see reflected to us like a mirror. We can sometimes see the ugliness of our own hearts and our selfish ways. And often we think we've just got to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and try harder. Just get it together, Sam. You're a man of God. Come on. We think we have to be more committed, try harder, pull ourselves to put ourselves together. But you know what? We cannot behave and modify ourselves enough to live a God-honoring life. Some of you need to hear that this morning. We cannot behave and modify ourselves enough, squeeze ourselves into this mold of, all right, I've just got to do better, and I've just got to do better, I've just got to try harder, and I know God loves me, but yeah, it's a bit disappointed about that, but I've just got to do better. That's not what the gospel teaches. Because we know deep down it doesn't work. And Pastor Bill has shared this illustration. I love it because it's helped me so many times. There's a ship called our life and we're driving it. (laughs) And we turn the wheel because we think, I want to be over here because I want to do what God wants me to do. So we turn the wheel and we think, you know what? I've just got to hold on. I've got to hold on. And the ship's turning. Okay, we're making progress. And then I get really tired and I can't hold on anymore and I let go. And where does it go? Straight back to where it was before. We don't need to try harder. We need to actually have uh, 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 an awareness and an an understanding. Jesus, you are the captain of my ship. You take the wheel. Because when you turn it, (laughs) when I cooperate with you, you don't actually get tired. You have unlimited resources and you've given me your Holy Spirit that can work in and through me so that when I actually want to do the wrong thing, I can say, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to listen to what God's Spirit wants me to do and I can go and do it. We cannot willpower ourselves into living a God-honoring life. Our conscience will always remind us that we don't have what it takes. (laughs) We can do all the outward keeping up appearances for a while, but we're powerless to change ourselves from the inside out. And so in Psalm 119 verse 80, it says, May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I might not be put to shame. The desire is there. Even the determination is there, but this is not enough. So the psalmist lifts his longing to God as a prayer May I, God, let this be be so. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I might not be put to shame. Jesus himself said to his friends on the night he was betrayed (laughs) and handed over to be killed, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. We know. We're very aware. (laughs) But that's not all he said at that moment. First, he said, watch and pray. You see, dependence on Jesus, reliance on his help, actually precedes doing what he asks. The psalmist in 119 recognises that though he longs to live a God-honouring life, he's decided in his heart that God is good, His instructions are true. He cannot, by willpower alone, carry out the commands of God. He cannot behave and modify himself, his way into living a God-honouring life. He's powerless to change himself from the inside out, perform well enough to make him good enough for God to go, perfect job, well done. And so are we. And I remember the first couple of years of my Christian life struggling with this. I remember sitting in my car and beating myself up over something that I'd done that I was so disappointed in myself with. And I was so annoyed with myself with. And I sat there going over it and over it and over it and over it. And I kept thinking, you know what? This is just, how do you even do this? How do you even follow Jesus? I don't think I can do this. And it was like, it wasn't like, it was. (laughs) I'd read something, I didn't even remember that I'd read it, but somehow it got on the inside of me from the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit had something He could work with, work with. and it was like all of a sudden a thought came into my head that I hadn't been thinking on, 
that was just the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God, illuminating it and shining it into my life when I needed it. And this is what it was. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Light broke into my world because the Word of God, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, actually showed me the truth that was bigger than my feelings. I need Jesus. (laughs) I need His help. This life that I live, of course I can't live it as a Christian on my own. I need Him. I had an aha moment. (laughs) In Psalm 119, verse 73 to 77, it says, Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I've put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you've afflicted me. (laughs) May your unfailing love be my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Now, why would he say, (laughs) in faithfulness you have afflicted me? That's a challenging verse. We don't sort of like to read that verse. We think, eh, I'm not sure about that one. (laughs) The psalmist is recognising that nothing's outside of God's sovereign control. God is sovereign over all the pieces of his life, even in allowing the psalmist to experience pain, suffering, persecution, even in experiencing the consequences for choosing to go astray from God's commands. Because he says in verse 67, my heart, when I went astray, and then I came back to your words, talks about him going astray and coming back. There's stuff that happens to you that we don't have a reason for why it happens. (laughs) Sometimes the reason we have is that we live in a world that is broken. We live in a sin-sick world and sometimes we can't explain why some things happen to good people, to people who are trying to do good. But God's goal for our life is not happiness. It's Christ-likeness. It's not happiness. The world tells us it's happiness. It's not happiness. His goal for, our, for your life is Christ-likeness. In faithfulness, he sometimes allows affliction. He doesn't necessarily cause it, but he allows it. And troubles and hardships and persecution and suffering. <laughs> sometimes he allows there to be a reaping of consequences when we choose to continue in willful disobedience to his word. But you know what? He doesn't ever do it to punish us, ever. Because Jesus took the punishment on the cross. He took your punishment. He's not angry with you. He's not punishing you. He loves you. So that's a lie from the pit of hell if you think God is punishing you. He loves you. Sometimes he'll allow a natural consequence to take place because he wants to train you and teach you how to discern the right from the wrong and choose the right. He's a loving father. He actually trains us and helps us because sometimes we don't want his help. We think, I got this, God. I can do it on my own. But sometimes he allows things so we'll reach the end of our trying and cry out to him for help and say, apart from you, I have no good thing. He allows circumstances we can't control because in our weakness, like Sam said this morning, he is sufficient We learn to rely on his power and his grace, to trust him, to rely on his loving kindness, even above ourselves, even above our feelings, though he doesn't invalidate our feelings. He he wants us to bring our feelings to him, but his truth and his word and his ways are higher than that. Some of you right now are facing very tough times. I don't know what it is that you're going through, but Jesus knows He knows, and he's not punishing you. He loves you. He's in control. He's worthy of your trust. 
God's goal for our life is Christ-likeness. In Romans 8.29, it says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape for our lives there in him. But when we look at, in, into the mirror, well, when the word of God reflects back to us like a mirror, our own lives, and we think, you know what? Jesus, you're awesome, but huh, I'm not sure about this bit. I'm not doing so well here. We're not meant to jump into behavior modification and pulling ourselves together and trying harder. <laughs> Nor are we meant to simply be hearers of the word, like it says in the book of James, where after looking at ourselves through the mirror of God's word, we go away and immediately forget what we look like. And you know why sometimes I think we do that? Because we don't really like what we see. I'm not talking about physical appearance here, right? <laughs> We, don't, we think, oh, I don't like that about myself. Oh, so annoying. We are to be doers of the word. How? <laughs> Not by trying harder. In James 1.25, it says, Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Do you know what I realized this week? I'd always read this like, yeah, the Word of God, look into the Word of God. It's awesome. It's got the promise. The perfect law that gives freedom is actually the gospel. The perfect law that gives freedom is actually Jesus saying, I've perfectly fulfilled all the requirements of the law. So when you look intently into the perfect law that brings freedom, you need to look intently and keep looking intently and keep coming back to Jesus. Take your eyes off yourself and your inability and your problems in terms of your own, I can't manage this and your own, I hate this about myself. Take your eyes off that and look at Him. The good news of what Jesus has done on our behalf is how we become a doer of the word because we say, you know what, I don't have what it takes, but thank you, Jesus, that you died for me, <laughs> that you were punished for me, that you forgive me, that you live in me because you're resurrected. And now there's a new power in operation on the inside. And I can live a God-honoring life and I can grow more and more like Jesus each day as I rely on you to help me. To be a doer of the word, we need to look intently at Jesus and what he's done for us. We need an increasingly clearer picture of Jesus, what his death and resurrection on our behalf means for our lives. Continuing in it, coming back to it, not just thinking we need, we need Jesus for salvation, then see you later, you'll be right, you're left to yourself. No, 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 we need Jesus to actually live the Christian life. The more we see him as he is in the scriptures, not as we think he is, not as we think he should be, the more we see him, the more we want to do, we want to do. We want to delight because we know who we are in Christ and we know what he's already done for us. The more we experience his faithful love, the more we want to come back to the scriptures, ready to listen and apply what the Holy Spirit is illuminating to us. And so if you hear nothing else today, young people, you need Jesus. Every person in this place, we need Jesus. He is the gift of grace we need to firstly become a child of God. He is the sustaining gift of grace we need to live as a Christ follower. Can I hear an amen? All right, you're allowed to be vocal. <laughs> Those that turn to him in simple trust are set free from having to follow our sin, your own sinful desires. Jesus has broken the power of sin. You don't have to listen to that temptation sitting on your shoulder saying, go over here and do that. You can look away from yourself and say, no, 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 I'm looking at Jesus. I'm looking at what he says about me. I'm looking at what he has for me. I'm looking at what his power can do through me. Have you been slipping into self-reliance instead of being Jesus-reliant? Throw it off. Keep throwing yourself on Jesus. 
Psalm 119 reminds us to depend on God's mercy. And when, I think it was David who wrote the psalm, sorry. That's just my opinion, I can't prove it. He just keeps coming back to God's mercy. (laughs) Reminds us to depend on God's mercy. Then it was a temporary gift dependent on ceremonial cleansing. But now it's ours forever. Secured with the blood of Jesus. It's ours forever. And so in Psalm 119 verse 77 it says, Let your compassion come to me that I may live. For your law is my delight. Let your compassion come to me so that I might live. Don't you see a picture of grace when he says that? John Stott wrote the following poem. Not merely in the words you say, not only in your deeds confessed, but in the most unconscious way is Christ expressed. Is it a beautific smile, a holy light upon your brow? Oh no, I felt his presence when you laughed just now. To me, it was not the truth you taught to you so clear, to me still dim. But when you came, you brought a sense of him. We bring a sense of him when we admit our need for and dependence on him. We bring a sense of him when we step out and do what he asks us to do believing that his Holy Spirit will help us. We bring a sense of him when we spend time in his presence, talking with him, engaging with and wrestling with his word and beholding his beauty. People notice it. They're saying, what is it that's different about you? People can see when we've spent time with Jesus. We need him. When we own up to this and keep coming back to this, His resurrection life, we sang about this morning, has free reign to work in us. When we say, I need you, Jesus, it's like we hand over the driving seat to Jesus, the captain of our ship, of our lives. We say, you take the wheel. People see it. They see it in our lives. Not perfection, but they see we could becoming more like him. I remember being in Papua New Guinea soon after the senior minister at the time, Pastor Keela, passed away. Um, a, f- a small team of us went, Pastor Bill was included, another girl and myself. And I remember being there and observing um, Gaywa, his wife, who's also now a CRC pastor. He died suddenly in his sleep and his Wife, I actually got to observe her up close very soon after the funeral. Um, uh, the other girl I was travelling with and myself stayed with a group of women, including her, in a house for um, a conference. And she was grieving the shock and loss of her husband, but she did it with such dignity and strength. It really left an impression on me. <laughs> she wore white on her first Sunday back in church to symbolise he was now in the presence of Jesus. And that she had a hope even in the midst of her mourning. There was sadness in her eyes and I'm sure in her heart, but she spoke publicly and testified to Christ's faithfulness and brought such a sense of him with her. We stayed with, like I said, with her and she was always kind and took interest in me and she was always thankful to Jesus. And I was really struck by that because I'm like, You're going through, like, really deep grief. (laughs) But she was interested in those around her. When she had so much pain, she allowed the resurrection of life, the resurrection life of Jesus to shine out of her as she threw herself on him. You know, wherever we go, whatever we face, we can bring a sense of him as we rely on his power. People will notice. People can sense it. Christ in us, <laughs> flowing through us. Jesus, you take the wheel, the ship of my life. You be the captain. I'm not going to try harder. I come back to you and rely on you. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For God is working in you. When I heard this verse and I had another Holy Spirit illumination, aha moment, I just bawled my eyes out. 
So I was just like, God, you're already working in me. Just stop trying, would you, Cass? <laughs> just stop trying so hard. God, you're already working in me. You're working on my desires. You're also working and giving me the power to do what pleases you. Not just my desires, but also the enabling power. That's awesome. How we need Jesus. In Psalm 119, the psalmist keeps looking to God's gracious promises. Be gracious to me according to your promise. Some of you came to church just to hear this today. Throw out behavior modification. Abandon it. Renounce it. Stop trying to make yourself act more like Jesus. You can't. His spirit, if you are a follower of Christ, his spirit is working in you. So what? What it actually looks like is surrender, surrender, dependence, Jesus, I need you. Doesn't look like trying harder. He's urging you and and ready to help you, but only you can choose to hand over the control of the ship of your life because he won't take it by force. You and I need Jesus. And I had to practice this myself this week, my goodness. Preaching a sermon on the word of God being a mirror to my face, I was like, oh, I can't stand up there. I had all these thoughts going, I'm like, mate, I just blew in that and I'm not really good at this and God, far out, I'm just blah, 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 and just went round and round and round. And the Holy Spirit started preaching to me <laughs> before I preached the word of God. He said, come on, Cass. What is the truth? Actually, you can't obey me, as in Jesus. You can't obey him. You actually need the Holy Spirit's help. That's what the Christian life is about. You don't stand up and speak of the glories of God and the goodness of Christ based on your qualification. You stand up and speak about that and declare about that and you serve him based on what Christ has done for you alone. I was like, thank you, Jesus. I need you. (laughs) There's a cathedral somewhere in Europe that has a high and lofty and beautiful ceiling. But the room is so narrow and the ceiling was so exalted that it was difficult to gaze upon. So the rectors placed a large mirror on the floor, tilted at the proper angle. And by gazing into the mirror, they could see the ceiling. And that's what Christ is. Our God is so holy and infinite and awesome and invisible and high and exalted and lifted up that we can't very well take in his glory. But Jesus is the image of the invisible God and he lowered himself. He made himself nothing, even obedient to death and death on a cross so that we might see and know know the living God and know what he's like. The sun perfectly mirrors God. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's why Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God thinks about you and feels about you and how he uh, is positioned towards you, look at Jesus. Keep coming back and looking at Jesus. God is not angry with you. He's not punishing you. He took your punishment on a cross. He loves you. He sent his Holy Spirit to come and live in us. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can only come and live in people who are holy. We've been made holy by the blood of Jesus. When we come to him, we turn to him, we say, I'm not going my way anymore, God. I'm going your way. I want your way for my life. He washes us clean. His Holy Spirit comes and lives within us, seals us with this promise of eternal life. And empowers us to follow Jesus. If we want to live a God-honoring life, we need to contemplate Jesus. Think on him. Read about him. Talk about him. Talk to him. (laughs) Think about his death and resurrection. Contemplate means to thoughtfully look for a long time. It means to think about, to ponder, reflect on, mull over, muse, dwell on, ruminate, chew over. 
brood on, puzzle over, turn over in one's mind. And I thought this week, how often do I turn over in my mind all the things that I'm not? And all the things that I can't do. How, many, how much do you do that? What if we turned, flipped that around and looked intently at Jesus and said, look at what he did for me. Look at what it cost him to go to the cross. Look at how beautiful he is and the way he interacts with people as he walks this earth. It makes us want to be like him. If you want to know what God is like and how he feels about you, contemplate Jesus. Don't try harder. The Bible says, fix your eyes. Gaze intently on him. The Holy Spirit showed me this verse this week as well, or brought it to my mind. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. I think I've got 13 there, but it's actually 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, contemplate, unveiled, means we can see him as the scriptures show us he really is, as the Holy Spirit reminds us. Unveiled means we don't have to hide anything from God. We don't have to feel ashamed when we come before him. We don't have to pretend and play games. He knows it all. But we can still come into his presence because of what Jesus has done. And we all who with unfailed faces contemplate, brood over, muse on, think about, chew over. <laughs> The Lord's glory are being transformed in his image. It's whatever you look at gets bigger in your life. Are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from us. No. Which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's a verse to memorize. You can put your own name there and cast with unveiled face. I've got nothing to hide, nothing to prove. Contemplate Jesus. The more I do this, the more I come to him. The spirits of work, he changes me to be more like him. With ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Praise be to God. We're going to contemplate him now and take communion. So, ushers, if you could get ready to hand out the elements. Because this is a fantastic way <laughs> that Jesus himself has asked us to contemplate him, to remember him. And it's interesting that he tells us to focus on the ultimate act, the ultimate display of God's love and glory, which is his death on the cross. Because when we come and we kneel at the foot of the cross and we admit our dependence on him, we actually find <laughs> his resurrection power, the life of God flowing through us with renewed intensity. So as you receive that little piece of bread, Cruscut, a little bit of grape juice. So the piece of crust that symbolizes his body, his body, his innocent body that was broken for you. And the little bit of grape juice represents his blood, the cost. Of him going to the cross, his blood that was shed for you. You just talk to him. Because as you think on him and his glory, <laughs> you start to become a bit aware, okay, Lord, yep, I see that the, what I've been doing and who you are doesn't quite match up this week, but 
I confess that. Because he's already made us clean. He just We sometimes get dirty feet. So we come back again and we say, Jesus, would you wash my feet? <laughs> I need you to just take the wheel in that area in my life where I've been trying to do it myself. You be the captain. Can you just do business with Jesus now? <laughs>